Buckle up and hold on. At our church, we love God. Make no mistake about that. At our church, we believe in God's radical, unconditional, and unwavering love for us. At our church, we believe that Jesus is God. We also affirm that you may or may not believe that Jesus is God. And we're not asking you to change your belief system before you attend our church. We're simply inviting you on a journey toward Jesus. For years, churches have placed a high priority on Jesus as the get out of hell free card. At our church, we place the highest priority on Jesus as a live life to the fullest invitation. At our church, we believe every person has a dream deep inside their hearts and that God put that dream there, not for our glory, but for His. At our church, we're not concerned with where you've been, but where you're going. At our church, we believe that the Bible is God's Word. It is real, it is living, it is active. We believe that people who don't go to church anywhere are not the enemy. They are real people who need the perfect love that only God can give. And we believe that God gives this love through, of all people, us. At our church, we do not and we will not display a holier-than-thou attitude toward anyone. We are all broken people, but He is putting us back together. And finally, and most importantly, at our church, we believe that Jesus really lived, that He really died on the cross, and that He really rose again on the third day. And we cannot and we will not candy coat or water down that message, ever. Today, you've chosen to sit yourself in the middle of a very safe place to hear a potentially dangerous message. Welcome to our church. Would you would please open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15. How many know that's the resurrection chapter in the Bible? Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, because we're going to talk about, I ain't kidding you, I get excited. Look, if Christ hadn't raised from the dead, I wouldn't be doing this. I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be serving Christ. I was having not too bad a time sinning. Amen. I knew how to sin. I knew how to sin good. I had fun sinning most of the time. Man, if, you, if you're a sinner, you don't have fun sinning, what a pathetic sinner you are, I tell you. Uh, when I was a sinner, most of the time I had fun sinning. You know, and the Bible says there's pleasure in sin. How many have read that in Hebrews? But then to read the rest of it, but it only lasts for a season. Hey, man, you're out there partying, you're getting hammered. Woo, and it's all fun till the next morning. Till you're talking to, white, to Ralph on the big white telephone. Y'all know what that means? The big white telephone's your toilet. And Ralph is you up chucking. Tell you, be surprised what you say under the anointing. Anyway, if Christ wasn't real, I wouldn't be doing this. I wouldn't. But see, you got to answer that question for yourself. You got to come to grips. Is he the risen Lord and Savior or is he not? Because if he's not, let's eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. And we're dead like a dog and there's nothing else. The resurrection of Christ is what solidifies and what confirms Christianity. 
The resurrection of Christ, if I could put it this way, Christianity, and I hate to use this word religion when referring to Christianity, because we who are Christians, we know we don't have a religion. We have a relationship with a living Savior, amen, who was raised from the dead, who talks to us, who leads us, who guides us, who gives us his life and his peace and his power and his spirit. We have a living Savior who we commune with every day, amen, who we walk with every day, amen, who's there to pick us up if we fall, right? Amen. Who's there that we can go to, should we yield to temptation and sin, thank God we can go right to our Savior, our Lord Jesus, and we can repent, and we can receive forgiveness, amen, and then we can walk with him on our journey. Can you say amen? amen. I tell you, I love it. I love it, we serve a risen Savior. So Christianity is the only religion, I hate saying that word, in the world where the person who was worshiped came and died for sinners. You know, in Islam, they want you to die for Allah, who if you do your research is not God, and it's not the same God, it's not Jehovah, Allah came out of the cabal, one of the statues. He's the moon god. You can look it up. Uh, but Christianity is the only, quote, religion where our God came in human flesh and died for our sins. It's the only religion where the creator who is worshipped lives inside the worshiper. I mean, yeah, we know he's there, but he, we know by the Holy Ghost he lives inside of us. Amen. It's the only religion where the one crucified rose from the dead. Now, in Islam, they don't believe that Jesus was crucified. They don't believe he ever died. Well, I got quiet on that. Y'all need to read your Bibles. Amen. It's ours is the only one. We have the risen Savior who appeared not only to the twelve, not only to his family after his resurrection, but your Bible says he appeared to over 500 witnesses at once, at the same time. Now see, because if you and your buddy came and said, yeah, I saw Jesus, okay, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. But if 500 people plus came and said, we saw him, Pastor Mike, we saw him. He talked to us for three hours. But you got to believe it. You can sit there and say, oh, I think that's all hokey pokey. Fine. That's your right. Given to you by your creator God. He gave you the power of choice. He also gave you a conscience. The reason God doesn't address any atheists in the Bible, here we go, because God doesn't believe in atheists. <laughs> and God doesn't call them atheists in the Bible. He calls them fools. <laughs> Let me tell you why. Not to be mean. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That's an atheist. But God calls him a fool. Why? Because the heavens declare the glory of God. All creation declare the glory of God. What, what, a, what a fool has to do, what an atheist has to do is, is look at everything coming to them through their five senses, everything coming to them, speaking to them in their conscience that God gave them, and they have to say, I don't believe that. Not only do I not believe that, I refuse to look into it. What if I came to you and I said, there's no gold in China? There's no gold. You say, Pastor Mike, how do you know there's no gold? Well, I just don't believe there is. Well, Pastor Mike, have you been to China? Nope. Well, let's say I did go to China. Have you been to China? Yeah, I've been there. I've been to Beijing. Okay, did you go out into the Chinese countryside and overturn every rock and, and dig in every place to where you can say assuredly there's no gold in China? No, I didn't do that. 
I looked at a couple of places and I didn't see any gold, so I just figured there's no gold in China. You'd say, Pastor Mike, you're an idiot. <laughs> Don't know who that's for. Amen, but God bless you. First Corinthians 15. Going to read a few scriptures. I encourage you to read the whole chapter. Because I'm telling you, everything hinges on the resurrection of Christ. And that's going to be plain to you in a few minutes why. So Paul writes, who brought a Bible? Let me see your Bibles. Let's see how many working Christians we have in the house. Okay. So we got some Bibles and then we got some glowing things that contain the Bible. There's a difference. This is a Bible. The glowing thing contains the Bible. I'm old fashioned. I'm just old. <laughs> Went to Florida. My wife and I for four days. Thank you for that. Thank you people for helping out while we were gone. What'd you do, pastor? Nothing. Good. Didn't do nothing. Went to the beach every day. I know making some of you jealous. I was born in Florida, so I went home to my native state. Amen. But we went to Fort Myers, just laid around, just lazy. But meditated, thought about stuff. And it, as much as I love Florida, this is where I belong. This is where I belong till God says otherwise. But thank you. Thanks for praying for us. It was just uh, refreshing. But we're back. We're ready to go to work. Amen. Moreover, brethren, here's Paul. Verse 1, 1 Corinthians 15. I declare unto you the gospel. Do you know what the gospel is? Don't answer that out loud. Many people think, yeah, I know what the gospel is, Pastor Mike. The gospel is Christ died for our sins. Well, that's, that's part of the gospel. That's why I don't want you to answer out loud, because I hate being one of those preachers. They go, what's the gospel? What's the gospel, son? And Adrian goes, well, Christ died for our sins. Yeah, that's good. That's close. But that ain't what I'm looking for. Oh, I hate, I never answer a preacher. Never. I never shout anything out either, because I've done it before, and I've been wrong. If God's a giver, what should we be? Givers? No, you got to learn to be a receiver. How are you ever going to receive from God? If God's a giver, what should we be? Receivers? No, you selfish thing. You need to be a giver. <laughs> just like God. So you, just don't answer preachers. When someone does answer them, lean over to your wife and go, they ain't been around long. <laughs> so when I say, what is the gospel? Don't answer. Because you might be... Only partially correct. Let's put it that way. So Paul had never seen Jesus in the flesh, the apostle Paul. Never. Never saw him. Paul saw Jesus when Jesus knocked him slap off that horse and down to the ground in Acts chapter 9. That's when Paul saw Jesus. And he saw Jesus more than once. So here's Paul. And he says, I'm, I'm going to write unto you, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, wherein you stand. Now watch this. By which you are saved, if. Somebody say if. Yeah. It's one of those if passages. By which you are saved, if you keep the, the memory, what I preached unto you, unless you've believed in vain. You believe for nothing. And then I'm going to bring these next two verses up on the screen so we can all be there together. He said, I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. How that, and here comes the gospel. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now, we in America, uh, us 21st century believers, we go, yeah, right, according to the scriptures. Paul didn't have the New Testament. He was writing the New Testament. He didn't even know he was writing the New Testament. So they didn't have the new. So when Paul says Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, he's talking about the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. He's talking about when Jesus walked down the road to Emmaus. I love this in Luke 24, and he's talking to those two disciples, and it's a seven mile journey, and Jesus begins, begins to tell them the things. They don't know it's him, that is Jesus. I mean, he begins to tell them the things concerning himself out of out of the books of Moses, first five books of the Bible, out of the Psalms, and out of the prophets, everything concerning himself. How would you like to be on that seven-mile journey? You don't even know it's Jesus, but there he is, and he's just quoting scripture after scripture after scripture. Can you, believer, can you, who trust in Christ, without the New Testament, can you prove 
the gospel. Amen. Yes. Can you go know what scriptures to go to? I'm going to help you a little bit today. Know what scriptures to go to to show that Christ died for our sins in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, that he was buried in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, and that he arose from the dead the third day in the Old Covenant. Woo, we're going to have fun today. I'm going to show you a little bit of that. That's the gospel right there. Not part of it, all of it. Everything underlined. Here's the gospel. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, I love this stuff. And as a Christian, you should love it too. So let me go to, let me show you a few scripture references that prove this. Isaiah 53, I would encourage you to read all of Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is what we call a messianic chapter. The whole chapter is about the Messiah whom Jesus is. Messiah means the promised one. Messiah means the anointed one. So when you see it, when it's Christ the Messiah, it's Christ the anointed one, Christ the promised one. Isaiah 53 is talking all about the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. All three are in that chapter. I, I highlighted chapter, uh, verse 6 because verse 6 talks about that on Jesus was laid the iniquity, the sin of us all. It was all laid on him, and he gave his life for our sins. Uh, verse 9 talks about him being buried. In fact, in Isaiah, it says he made his grave with the rich and the wicked in his death. Now, how's that, how's that, Pastor Mike? Because where was he crucified? On Calvary, right? Between what? Two thieves. There's the wicked. After he died, he, hung, he died on the cross between two thieves. After he was dead, what'd they do? A, a, a man, Joseph of Arimathea, right? A Pharisee who believed in Jesus, went to Pilate said, can I take his body? Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man. And so the Bible says that Joseph placed Christ in his tomb. There it is with the rich and the wicked in his death. Now, those are just a few prophecies. Jesus Christ fulfilled over 300 prophecies in the short, in, in the short 33 years of his life. He fulfilled more than 30 of them between his arrest and his resurrection alone. That's incredible. Uh, Psalm 16, excuse me, Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is written by King David, a lover of Jehovah. Psalm 22 was written a thousand years before Christ. Psalm 22 was written hundreds of years before the practice of crucifixion became known and was used for execution. In Psalm 22, though, you have a more accurate picture of what crucifixion is than you do in any of the four Gospels. Isn't that amazing? Then we have uh, Zechariah 12.10. I put that up there because Zechariah 12.10 is another messianic scripture that talk, talking about Jesus says, they, the people, will look on him whom they have pierced. There again, hundreds of years before crucifixion was ever known or even practiced as a form of execution. And then one of my favorites is Jonah. Remember Jonah? Jonah was a prophet of God back in, you know, back in the Old Testament time. And God told Jonah, he said, listen, Nineveh's over there. I want you to go to Nineveh, Jonah, and I want you to preach to the Ninevites who were the enemy of Israel. I want you to preach to them and I want you to tell them they need to repent because in 40 days, I'm going to destroy that place except they repent. And Jonah said, I ain't going. And God said, I want you to go to Nineveh. Jonah said, I'm going that way. Anybody in here ever done that? A few people. The rest of you, we're going to have an altar call for liars at the end of the service. Amen. And so Jonah said, no way. I'm going this way, God. I don't want to preach to them. I want them destroyed. That's a wrong attitude. So Jonah goes on a ship, right? He's headed to where? Tarshish, 
right? It's what your Bible says. So he's on this ship, and because Jonah's on the ship, all of a sudden God sends this, this storm and everything, and the ship is going all over the place, and the other crewmen there, they're, the ship people there, they're like, what in the world is going on? And they're trying to figure out, and they're going to their gods, and they can't figure it out. And finally Jonah says, look, it's me. I'm the problem. And he thinks he's going to outsmart God. He can't take his own life, but he thinks if they throw me over, it'll be on them. He said, so he tells him, he says, hey, throw me overboard, your problems will be solved. How many thought that about your spouse? Don't do that. That's a bad idea. <laughs> so they grab Jonah. They throw him overboard because he's figuring, I'm going to drown. It's not suicide because they threw me over. So they throw him over. He goes in the sea. But what's the Bible say? God prepared a great fish, the gospel says a whale, to swallow Jonah and to keep him alive. I'm telling you, you can try to run from God. You can try to outwit God. You can try to outsmart God. You can think that you can plan ahead and God doesn't know your plans, yet the Bible says God knows the very secrets and the intents of your heart, that he knows the words that come out of your mouth before you even speak them. He knows your uprising. He knows your downsetting. He knows, he knows you better than you know yourself. And he still sent his son to the cross. Isn't that amazing? That's so, so Jonah thinks, I got it, man. So they throw him in, but a great fish swallows Jonah. But that's in there because after three days, that fish spit Jonah up. You see, because listen to me. If all we said was part of the gospel, that Christ died for your sins... That, that's just part of the gospel. That's not, that's not the whole gospel. The whole gospel is that he was buried. And that on the third day, why the third day? Because Jonah, after three days, in the heart of that fish, he was spit up on the land. It would have been no credence for Jesus to refer, because Jesus refers to, to Jonah chapter 1, verse 17, when he's telling, trying to explain to his disciples, the Son of Man is going to go into Jerusalem. He's going to be betrayed. He's going to be beaten beyond recognition. He's going to be crucified. He's going to be put in the grave, and for three days, but as was the case of Jonah. They said, give us a sign. He said, as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so the Son of Man is assigned to you. If Jonah never would have been spit up, Jesus never could have used that reference. But just as the fish spit Jonah up, hell had to spit up Christ. I like this stuff. This is exciting me. 1 Corinthians 15, drop down to verse 12. Even in Paul's day, even in Paul's day, man, first century A.D., you had, you had people going around coming up with false doctrine, coming up with heresies. I, I took, remember when Paul in Acts 20, he gathers the elders of Ephesus outside the city because Paul's headed to Jerusalem and he knows they won't see him no more. And he gathers the elders and he says, I, I want to remind you, he said, I want you to watch over, take care of the flock of God, which God has made you overseers. He said to them, beware, because Evil men are going to creep, after I leave, he said, evil men are going to creep in to, to, to bring blasphemy, to bring heresies. He said, yes, even of your own selves shall men rise up and try to draw people after themselves. He warned them. So even in first century AD, we have all kinds of, of blasphemies going on, all kinds of heresies going on. Remember Jude, the half-brother of Jesus who wrote the book of Jude? When he said, I wanted to write to you of the common salvation, but because of the heresies going on, I've got to re re retract that, and I need to warn you to contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. My God, we need that today. The, the, the church, especially the Western church, is so far removed from biblical faith and biblical Christianity. One preacher said he believes that 80 to 85% of, of all the people that attend church are tares, T-A-R-E-S. Who's got the cricket sound on their phone? Let it go out right now. Thank you. And I tell you, I don't know if it's that high, but I, I believe it to be over 50%. That 50% of people sitting in churches today, they're tares. They're not wheat. 
They look like a Christian. They talk like a Christian. They act like a Christian. The tares and the wheat were sown together. And they grow up. And the only way to tell them apart, they look so much alike. The only way to tell them apart is when the time of fruit. Because the wheat will bear fruit and the tares won't. Why won't the tares bear fruit, Pastor Mike? Because they're selfish. They don't want to lay their life down. It's all about them and their life. They go to church for what the church can do for them. Wow, we're preaching on the resurrection. Let me get off of that. Okay. So, here we are. What did I tell you? Verse 12. He said, now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you, there is no resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of the dead got Paul in trouble more than anything else he preached. You know why? If there's a resurrection of the dead, of the just and the unjust, you know what that says? That says that you and I are responsible for how we live our lives and that you and I are going to come before a holy God on judgment day to give account of our lives. That's exactly what it means. People don't care if you preach the crucifixion of Christ for sins. Oh, that's lovely. People don't care if you preach the social gospel about the feeding of the 5,000. Oh, how wonderful. People don't care if you preach a healing Jesus who alleviates pain and suffering. Oh, that's great. Well, you preach a resurrected Jesus. A Jesus that's been raised from the dead. The first fruits, the Bible says. That condemns a lot of people because they know then. They don't want to believe it because they know they're going to be resurrected. There's a resurrection of the just and the unjust. Thank God for Jesus. When we're resurrected on that day, whoo, we Christians are at the judgment seat of Christ because we're saved. We're not at the judgment seat of Christ to see if we're saved. No, we're there, thank God, because we're saved, because of what Jesus did in his death, burial, and resurrection. Amen. We're there at the judgment seat of Christ to see did, how much of your life you lived on the foundation of the love of God, how much of your life you did on selfishness. And you're there, we're there to get re, to rewards or to turn around and see our rewards go up in flames. But thank God we're still saved. Because we're saved not by works. We're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and putting our trust in him. Amen? So, that's a good thing. So, let's go on. He said, if there be, verse 13, if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is vain and your faith is vain. Isn't that an interesting thing? Well, pastor, can I believe in a dead savior? Uh, no. <laughs> pastor, can I just believe that Jesus died for my sins? No. That's what a lot of people want to believe. Because they don't want to be responsible for the resurrection in their own life. Oh, it's good preaching. Okay. Good teaching, I should say. If Christ be not risen, our preaching is vain, your faith is vain. Look at 15. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God. Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ risen. How many thinks Paul's being redundant here? A good preacher is always redundant. My friend Dale, he has a shirt I love. It, 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 it's a, a joke about redundancy. It says, Department of Redundancy Department. <laughs> That's every preacher's sweatshirt right there, man. A preacher's not worth anything if he's not redundant. I'm just telling you. We learn from the best. We learn from Paul. We learn from Jesus. So here we go. Verse 16, if the dead rise not, then Christ is not risen. I'm going to bring the next verse up on the screen. I want you to read it and watch this. And if Christ be not raised, not if Christ not die on the cross. If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, worthless. You are yet in your sins. You ever read the Bible and say, Man, I, I question that. What do you mean? I mean, let's look at it again. 
If Christ be not raised, your faith is worthless. You're yet in your sin. But Pastor Mike, I thought Jesus died for my sins. He did. But that's just part of the gospel. He has to be raised from the dead to validate, if I could put it that way, to, he validated his own crucifixion. He validated his own resurrection. They didn't, you know, I mean, we know God used the Romans and we know that the Jews said crucify him, crucify him. But Jesus told his disciples, this commandment have I received from my father. I lay my life down and I take it up again. No man taketh it from me. If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You're dead in your sins. We don't serve. Oh, where is it? We don't serve a dead Savior. I told Eskenazi, pray I don't throw this. He goes, now you're worrying me. He's not on the cross anymore. This is only half of the, a third of the gospel. This is a wonderful part of the gospel. But this is not entirely the gospel. The gospel is Christ died for my sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and then he was raised from the dead according to the scriptures. So Paul writes in Romans, this is an interesting verse, talking about Jesus who was delivered for our offenses, our sins. Yes, that's why he went to the cross. Because of us. Because of our sins. He went to the cross because we were criminals against God. He went to the cross because we were God's enemy. What a wonderful God to send his son to die for his enemies. Have you ever heard such a thing? So, he's delivered for our offenses, but watch this. He was raised from the dead for our justification. Justified means to be declared righteous. Justified means to be in right standing with God. Justified, we have a play on words of that. Justified, just as if I've never sinned. That we can stand before God because Christ was raised from the dead and offered his blood. We'll talk about that in a second. Because Christ was raised from the dead and took his blood into heaven and offered it on the mercy seat, the heavenly mercy seat, and he bought us back. That's what the word redeem means. Redeem means to buy back. And your, your Bible tells you that you were redeemed by the blood of the lamb. Your Bible, te- lamb, your Bible tells you you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. The Bible says you were not purchased with silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. The blood didn't just stay there. He was raised for our justification. Let me, let, me, let me go on and we're almost done. Wesley, can you come play, please? Just Wesley. This is a picture, uh, artist conception. Obviously, he didn't have cameras back then. Uh, now, this is not Solomon's temple. This is not the temple in Jerusalem. This is the tabernacle in the wilderness that Moses built that God told Moses, I'm gonna show you a pattern and I want you to build what I tell you to build. Make sure you build it precisely to the blueprints that I've shown you. When you read in Hebrews, which I would encourage you today, if you can, to read four chapters in the book of Hebrews, chapter seven, eight, nine, and 10. Seven, eight, nine, and 10 in Hebrews. Please read it this afternoon. It doesn't take you very long. It'll take you 13 minutes. Seven, eight, nine, and 10. Because it's gonna talk about this. Back in the, in the, and I'm going to call it the Jews' religion, because that's all they had. In the old covenant, all they had was religion. Paul referred to the Jewish covenant, the Old Testament, the old covenant as the Jewish religion. There's a difference between religion and relationship. Religion is do this, don't do that. Religion is operate this way, don't operate that way. Pastor, don't Christians do that? Yeah, but we do it because we have the love of Christ in us. We, we do things and don't do things because we love Christ. Not because something tells us to do that. The Bible tells you we're studying this on Wednesday nights in Galatians. The law, the the commandments of God were not made for a righteous person. Why? The righteous person has the spirit of God living in them, directing them. They that are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. 
It's a big difference between religion and relationship. All the Jews had primarily was a religion. Now, a few of them had a relate. We know David had a relationship with God. We know Moses had a special relationship with God, don't we? We know, we know many of the prophets did, but for the main part, for most of the people, all they had was a religious system that where they could only have their sins covered for a year. So God sets this tabernacle up. There's three parts to this. The, the part that's not up there is called the courtyard. This middle part here is called uh, the holy place. And then the part with the Ark of the Covenant, if you ever watch Raiders of the Lost Ark, kind of looks like that. The part with the Ark of the Covenant, that's called the holiest of all, or the holy. Now, it, it, this is, the Bible's just so interesting. I love it when people go, oh, anybody can write the Bible. I'm like, you're an idiot. You don't even know. Remember when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and you can do this on a study on yourself. The courtyard is the way. The holy place is the truth. And where God dwells in the holiest of all is the life. I'm telling you, the Bible's amazing. It's just simply amazing. So the, the high priest, because there's all these priests and then there's a high priest. So the high priest, here's what he has to do. Once a year, he's got to take a, a, a bull for his sins, slaughter that bull, pour, have that blood poured out for his sins. Then he has to take a, 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 a goat for the sins of the people, which they had two. They had one was a, a live goat, a scapegoat, and one that they sacrificed, and that was for the blood of the people. And then when he got all done with this, he would go out, lay his hands on the live goat, and confess the sins of all of Israel over the live goat. Probably took him a couple of months. I don't know how long it took him. It took a long time. Then that goat was let go to be led out in the wilderness where God killed it. All this, all this stuff is types and shadows that point to Jesus. None of this stuff in the Old Testament could, could purify you. None of this stuff in the Old Testament could wash away your sins. None of this stuff in the Old Testament could restore the life of God back in you. It was all there until Christ came. That's what we're studying about Wednesday night, the book of Galatians. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The law and all the ceremonies, everything pointed to Jesus, pointed to the Messiah. It's quite the thing when you get into it. And so the high priest, he would, he would do that. And then only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was, where the mercy seat was, where the, both angels face towards the mercy seat, looking at it, wondering, because the New Testament says the angels desire to look into salvation. They don't understand it. And that's why God had them gazing at the mercy seat. I tell you, this stuff's amazing. When you go to Leviticus 16, if you're taking notes, read Leviticus 16. Leviticus 16 is all about the priest and the high priest going in, and he takes the blood of, of, of bulls, and he takes the blood of goats, and he goes into the holiest of all, and he sprinkles it on the covenant, on the mercy seat. When he's all done with that, the sins of the people are covered for that year. They're covered not done away with. The reason the blood of bulls and goats cannot do away with our sin is because you're not an animal. I don't care what the schools and the colleges tell you, you're not an animal. You are created in the image and likeness of God. You're an image bearer of God. And the Bible says because of Adam, because of man, sin came. By man, Jesus, God coming in human flesh, came salvation. Couldn't be wrought through an animal. But God did this and, and, because that's all he could do until the promised one came, the Messiah. It's quite the thing. It's a lot to get into in the three hours I have left. <laughs> so he would go in. You say, Pastor, why is this important? Because everything in the Old Testament is a type and a shadow and points to Jesus. You, you can't really understand the New Testament without an under, somewhat of an understanding of what's happening in the Old Testament. I love Andy Stanley, but he's wrong when he says we don't need the Old Testament. 
No, I don't need it to get saved. I don't need it to get right with God because it couldn't make anybody right with God. It says in the book of Galatians, if perfection, if forgiveness of sins, if the cleansing of your conscience could have came through, doing, through the law, through ceremony and all that, that's the way it would have came. But there was no commandment that could have given life. And what we lost in the garden was the life of God dwelling in us. And when you repent and you say, Jesus, come into my life and be my Lord and my Savior, he not only forgives you of your sin, he brings the life of God back in you. That's what changes you. So if you're sitting here and you say, I know Christ, but your life isn't changed, you're still a liar, a gossiper, a fornicator, a drug user, an alcohol, you don't know Christ. You don't have his life in you. All you have is religion. That's the difference. I got to get on. So, in Hebrews 7, 8, 9, and 10, it talks about Jesus who, he is our Savior, he is our Lord, he is our healer, he is our deliverer, he is our provider, but he is also our high priest. Just as the high priest went into the holiest of all with the blood of bulls and goats, we're going to read this, Christ, when he was raised from the dead, took his own blood and entered into the holy place in heaven itself. Because remember, all this is a, is a copy of the heavenly things. There's a verse in, in, in Hebrews, I believe it's in chapter 10, and it talks about the vessels of ministry here in the old covenant having to be cleansed with blood and then it talks about the vessels of ministry in the heavenlies having to be cleansed but something be cleansed with something greater than the blood of bulls and goats obviously pastor what's all that mean i don't know what it means i just i don't try to come up man you could probably come up with some chris with some type of twisty doctrine and and say oh i got a new teaching no, just say, this is what the Bible says. You understand it all, Pastor Mike? No, I don't. But the Bible says that Christ, when he rose from the dead, took his blood up into heaven and offered it on the heavenly mercy seat so the heavenly utensils of worship could be cleansed. That's all I know. I don't know anything beyond that. But he had to do it. So here we go. But Christ being come and high priest, he's our high priest right now. The Bible says he's seated at the right hand of God and he ever lives to make intercession, to make prayers for you and me. But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and a more perfect tabernacle, not made with hand, not the one Moses made. That is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place. That's talking about heaven. Yes. Having obtained eternal redemption. Redemption means to buy back. Pastor, are you a Christian? Yes, I've been bought by the blood of Jesus. I've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. I've been bought back. Jesus rose from the dead, went into the heavenly holy of holies, presented his blood as payment for my sins, and God accepted it. That's why the resurrection. The gospel's not complete without it. He didn't just die for my sins. He was buried. And after three days, he came from the dead, ascended to heaven, did exactly what these verses said, presented his blood as a sacrifice or as a payment for our sins, and God accepted it. So now God, who is legal and holy and just and righteous, can, can extend a pardon, offer a pardon to unrighteous people because of the righteousness of his son. And if the unrighteous people receive God's pardon, the righteousness of his son is applied to their account. That's what it means to be saved. That's good stuff. Only got two and a half hours left. Amen. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, because they had to sprinkle on, sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, or in other words, it allowed the people's sins to be covered so they could approach God without being killed because he's so holy. How much more 
shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Now let me say this and we're, we're going to take communion. Fellows, bring the table back over. Oh, never mind. Just leave it there. Ushers, come. You that are, we're going to take communion here. I'm going to explain that in a minute. But look at this. See that last part? How much more shall the blood of Christ purge your conscience? Your conscience. Your conscience. How many people commit suicide because of their conscience? How many people live in depression because of their conscience? How, how many people are in bondage because of their conscience? Listen, you got to hear this. Don't watch them. Y'all just stand up here a second. Or stand where you're supposed to stand. That's fine. However you're doing it, just stand for a second. When you realize you're a sinner and you ask Christ to come into your life and you mean it and he comes in, he not only forgives you of your sin, he not only puts his life in you, the Bible says he takes away your guilty conscience. You know the Apostle Paul was a murderer? How many know Apostle Paul was a murderer? And yet, in Christ, the Apostle Paul stood one day and he said, I stand in good conscience before God and men. How could he say that? Because when he got saved, the blood of Christ purged his conscience. Not his memory, his conscience. Yeah, I used to be that guy. Yeah, I used to persecute the church. Yeah, I did put people to death. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And with a clear conscience, I can stand before God. Why? Because I've been washed by the blood of Christ. Go ahead and pass that out. We're going to take communion. And let me tell you, don't get religious on me about communion. Communion is not a religious thing. Communion is a relationship thing. So you may be here and you say, Pastor, but I'm not a member of your church. Pfft. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can take communion only if you're a member of that church. It doesn't say that. Communion, are you a believer? you believe in Christ? Do you have respect for the Lord's Supper, then you can take communion. If you have small children and you believe that they know enough about the communion being representative of the body of Christ and being representative of the blood, then parents, you decide to let your children partake or not, okay? But you don't have to be a member of this church to part. We don't even have membership. And I want to read this, and then we're done. First Corinthians 11. This is what Paul said about communion. He said, I received of the Lord Jesus that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, in the very night he was betrayed, I love the Amplified, says, while his betrayal was in progress, he took bread... And he broke it. What's the bread symbolic of, people? The body of Christ. Was his body broken? Was it crushed for us? Yes, not a bone. The Bible said not a bone in his body was broken. Isn't that amazing? But the Bible says in Isaiah 53 that it pleased God, his Father, to bruise him, to crush him. No man was ever beaten more than Jesus. I love the fact that Mel Gibson did that movie on, the, on uh, the, pa the, the passion and he did a great job with the makeup on how horrible Christ looked but it don't even come close to what the Bible says the Bible says that the way Jesus looked his visage the way he looked was so marred more than any other man you study that out in the Hebrew it says he didn't even resemble a human being Nobody wants a picture of the cr true crucifixion in their house because it just looks like a bloody mass of meat hanging there, barely recognizable as a human. Why was his body broken? Why do we have two elements in communion? Why do we have the cup and, why do we, and the bread? Why not just the cup? Listen, the, the, the blood is what cleanses us from sin, right? It's the blood. We just saw all that. The blood is what brought us back to God. So why in the world was Christ beaten beyond recognition? Why did he say, look at this bread, I'm going to break it. This bread is my body broken for you. The blood is for your spiritual cleansing and healing. The bread is for your physical healing. 
You gotta, you gotta know that. Otherwise, let's just take the, the blood and go. There's two elements, and we're gonna read it right here. Remember, Jesus said, oh, let's just read it. He said, when he had given thanks, he took bread and he broke it, and he said, it broke it, that's so important, he broke it. His body broken for us, so we could have health and healing. If you're sick today, when you take communion today, I want you to believe God for healing. I want you to believe that God to heal you through taking communion. This is not a religious thing. This is a relational thing. When Jesus stood that day and said, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. They, they said headlines, Jesus announces cannibalism. When really the inside story was, he was talking about having an intimate relationship with him. That's what communion is, people. Oh, it's an intimate relationship with Jesus you're about to experience. Thank you. So we're just going to do this. He held up the bread and he, and look, I want you to look at it through the lights. You see holes in your bread? Huh? See, the, this is real matzah bread. This is what the Jews make. They don't even know why they make it this way. The holes are for the piercings in Jesus' body. And if you have a bigger piece, you'll see some stripes on it. The stripes are for the stripes laid on his, on his body for your healing. And then you'll look and you'll see some scorch marks. And you say, well, Pastor, Jesus wasn't scorched. He wasn't burned. No, but fire typifies judgment. And Jesus was judged on the cross for our sin. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool, Chris? All that in the matzah bread. And they don't even know why they make it. They just, well, that's the way we're supposed to make it. Because they don't believe Jesus was the Messiah. He took bread and he lifted it up, lifted it up for him. Lord Jesus, we recognize you said this is your body broken for us. Lord, crushed and bruised by God for our health and our healing. Lord, we ask you to bless it. And we partake saying, and I encourage you to say this, Jesus, by your stripes I'm healed. And then partake. And when you hear the crunching in your mouth, every crunch, Think of a, a blow being laid on Jesus, that whip being laid across his back for our healing, for our health. Then the Bible says, he took the cup. Let's take the cup. I'm 10 minutes over service. Who's going to forgive me? I'm 10 minutes over on Easter. Thank you. This way the restaurants are clear out and you'll be next in line. Amen. Amen. And after the same manner, he took the cup. And after he had supped from it, he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Hold on a second. He said, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup. So you don't have to wait for church. Young people, people, you can get up every morning, have communion in your own home. Families can have it together. Husbands and wives. We have a husband and wife has it every morning in their home. Don't wait for church. We have it every Tuesday night at prayer, every Tuesday. As often as you drink, eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. You proclaim his victory over sin, hell, sickness, and the grave. And then it says, it gives a warning. It says, if you take it in an unworthy manner. What's an unworthy manner, pastor? You take it just like, uh, yeah, it's just communion. It's just what we do. There's nothing to it. You're taking it in an unworthy manner. And the Bible says if you do that, you eat and drink damnation to yourself. So don't do that. Recognize it's symbolic of the blood and the body of Jesus. And Jesus, we do. We lift up the cup, Lord, and we thank you for the blood of the new covenant, New Testament. We thank you that we've been redeemed by your blood. We thank you, Jesus, you've bought us back. And Lord, your blood has cleansed us from all sin. We ask you to bless it, and we partake. And I'd encourage you to say, I'm saved by the blood of Jesus. Every head bowed, every eye closed, please. We're closing. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, 
I, I need to get right with Jesus. Or, Pastor, I've never known him as my Savior. I've just, I believe in him, but I've never surrendered my life. And I want to do it today, Easter Sunday. So if you say, Pastor, I need to recommit my life to Christ. Or, Pastor, I want to receive Christ as my Lord and Savior. Please stand up right where you're at. I want to pray for you right where you're at on this Easter Sunday. Please stand. If that's you, you know you need to make things right with Jesus. Don't be, there's one. Amen. There's two. You know you need to make things right with Jesus. You're not standing for me, man. You're standing for Jesus. He loves you. Shed his blood for you. You want to make, come on. You may be out there. You say, Pastor, I need to recommit. Come on, stand. Recommit your life today. I, I urge you. I urge you. Anyone else? I'm going to wait 10 more seconds. Anyone else? Anyone else? I see three. There's a third one. There's a fourth one. Come on. There's a fifth one. Five people standing saying, I, I need Jesus in my life. You don't need me. I can't help you much. You don't need the church. The church can't help you much. You need Jesus. Jesus can help you every way. Anyone else? Pastor, I want prayer. I want Christ in my life today, Easter Sunday. All right, let's all stand. You five that stood, listen. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I want, I want us all, let's look heavenward. I want you to get your mind and your heart set on Jesus. He loves you. Close your eyes, get your mind and your heart set on him. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. You say it to Jesus and you mean it. And I promise you, if you say it and you mean it, he'll hear your prayer. He'll answer your prayer. And when you say amen, he will have come into your life, forgiven you of all of your sins, given you the life of God. Amen. Wrote your name in the book of life. And you'll have a new relationship with Jesus. The rest of us, we're going to pray with them for support. Amen. Let's pray. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you that you went to the cross in my place for my sins. And you took my judgment because you love me. You shed your precious blood. You died. You were buried. But you rose from the dead. On the third day, and you're alive today, and I ask you, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Be my Lord and be my Savior. I receive you now, and I receive your life, and I receive your forgiveness, and I thank you right now, and let's thank you right now. Now, one other thing, you that raised your hands and you can stay together, bring a friend or relative. I got two people in the back, Jessica and Kirby Young. Please go with them right now for three minutes. They want to put a gift in your hand. They want to put a thing to help you in your walk with Christ and just pray with you. Take three minutes. You guys go do that. Let's clap for them. Amen. Go back there now. Thank you for letting me go over. Please give my regards to the nursery workers. Tell them I love them. Lord Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you you touched a whole family and some others. Lord Jesus, thank you you're alive. Go with these people. We bless your name. Amen. God bless you.